and be able to know some measure of blessing thereby as well. Lovely to have you with us, and we gather to worship God, to bring our praise to God. Let's join then in the singing of the paraphrase of that passage at the start of 1 Peter. Uh, Blessed be the everlasting God, the Father of our Lord. Let us worship God. Let's bow now together in prayer before God. Let us pray. God, our Father, again and again, you simply haul us back from all that has otherwise occupied our attention and our energies and our time. You haul us back to the things that really matter. And you remind us that you are indeed not only that God who made the whole universe in which we live in all its vastness, in all its beauty, in all its order, but you are the God who has come to us here on planet Earth and you have uh, planted this bombshell in the life and death and resurrection of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that which changes everything. And we bless you and praise you for that. We're glad, living God, that you didn't simply remain aloof and afar off pointing the finger at us for all the many, many ways in which we had gone astray and done our own thing and pursued our own agenda. But you came and you rolled up your sleeves and you did for us what we could never do ourselves and thereby met us in our deepest need and met the demands of your righteousness, met the burden of your heart to be merciful and provided for us in your Son the most extraordinary, the most wonderful, the most glorious way of salvation, our truest well-being, our truest security, our truest joy. And you did that in order that you might demonstrate the beauty and the splendor of your own glory, that it may be evident to all the universe and all through eternity that you are altogether wise, wonderfully wise, wonderfully kind, wonderfully righteous, wonderfully strong and mighty. And we're glad, therefore, to join with one another to own your greatness, to bless you as that everlasting God, the Father of our Lord, and to rejoice in all that you have wrought for us in him. And we pray, Lord God, that as we do thus gather tonight, our hearts may be warmed and stirred afresh by your own Holy Spirit, that our eyes may be opened wide once again to 
to appreciate to the full something of the splendor and glory that belongs to your risen Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that we might revel in the sheer wonder of all that you have wrought for us and might be glad to own him all over again as Lord and as Savior, as our King and as our friend. So be near to us, living God, we pray you and grant us your help as we apply ourselves to the worship of yourself. We need your Holy Spirit, our Father, in order that we may indeed from our hearts with eyes and hearts wide open to your glory, bring to you that praise that is your due help us, Father, that our gathering here should not be in vain and should be in all regards for your own greater praise and glory. And we ask it through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, if you've been here with us over the course of the past few weeks, um, you'll be aware that we are slowly working our way through Paul's second letter to Timothy and uh, have kind of not quite got stuck, but we've slowed down at uh, verse 8 of chapter 2. We will come back to that verse. So if you'd like just to keep a finger in that, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're going to read this evening from um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and Matt is going to come and read the passage for us from there now. This evening's reading is from 1 Corinthians 15 and reading from verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I, pa- I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised... Your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, The resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn. Christ, the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. 
for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he has put everything under his feet. Now, when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him, who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Amen. But as I say, we'll uh, be turning to Second Timothy shortly, but before we do so, uh, we're going to sing again a song that uh, celebrates Jesus as the hope of the nation. Jesus, hope of the nations. Well, let's pray. Our Father, as we turn to your word, we ask please for that illumination from your Holy Spirit, that he would be our instructor in such a manner that our lives should be transformed and that we should be the better equipped thereby to live out our lives in the power of your Spirit for the praise of your glory. A lot, Father, always has to do with the perspective that we have, the way in which we view and understand the world in which we live and the circumstances attendant upon our lives. And so we pray that you would yourself frame that perspective and enable our eyes to be fixed clearly and firmly on Jesus and to delight in him. And this we ask for his name's sake. Amen. 
Well, as I say, it's uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8 that we are um, really focusing on at the, the present time. Uh, Paul is writing to a younger colleague by the name of Timothy, who is pastor of a, a church that is increasingly um, facing difficulties and a church that is increasingly in decline, if you can call it that, a church that kind of still believes the right things, but is, is just losing something of its edge, something of its love for the Lord, and uh, a little bit too easily becoming distracted by other things. And he's uh, writing to Timothy uh, towards the end of his, namely Paul's life, with a view really to, to lay before Timothy that which will enable him to minister effectively and fruitfully in that context. And at this particular point, he is simply saying to Timothy, remember Jesus. Uh, keep him center stage always. Keep him center stage in your own heart. Keep him center stage before the people to whom you minister because uh, he is what it is all about. Uh, very easily, just to get our eyes off him, very easily for a congregation of people to end up divesting their energies in a range of other worthwhile, noble causes, but uh, just not bang center, uh, focused on and delighting in Jesus. The one thing that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is able to do that no one else can do is to proclaim the good news about Jesus, a message that God declares is absolutely essential to be heard. There is no other name given under heaven whereby men and women and girls and boys may be saved. No other name. And therefore, it is incumbent upon God's people to, uh, to bring that message of good news to the world in which we live, a world that is full of need, a world that is full of uh, all sorts of problems, all sorts of vexing issues that uh, uh, trouble people, disturb people, confuse people, frighten people. And into that, there is a message that uh, simply pulses with hope. And that's a message that is centered around Jesus. This verse, um, chapter 2, verse 8 of 2 Timothy, uh, is, is one of the most concentrated statements of the whole gospel um, that you will find in the Bible. Um, Paul uh, has uh, had this concern really to lay before Timothy the essence of of the message. You'll see that immediately following what he says there in verse 8, uh, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel. And so in that preceding sentence, you have the essence, the, the primary components of the message that comprises that good news. And so if you want just a very short summary statement to be able to uh, pass on to anyone, uh, there you have it. Sitting at the bus stop and waiting for a bus and you've got to maybe 10 seconds and the person standing next to you says, uh, tell me, what is it that you believe? Um, you've got it. You can do that in 10 seconds. Uh, Jesus is the Christ. He's raised from the dead. He's descended from David. That's the good news. And uh, if I can get on the bus with you, I'll, I'll happily sit beside you and explain why that is good news. Now, we looked at the first of those statements that Paul made last week, uh, namely that he is the Christ, the anointed one. Um, that's the, the role, as it were, that he fulfills, um, the role that combines together the ministry of the prophet, the priest, and the king, uh, all found now in the one person, the one who brings the word of God and speaks that word with all its power into our hearts and lives, the one who ministers the grace of God and applies that grace in all its healing and renewing and, and restoring power to our hearts and lives, and the one who exercises the rule of God in our lives, that rule of God that is altogether good. And that's the first great statement that Paul makes. Jesus is the Christ. The whole Old Testament was pointing forward always to the coming under God of one who would fulfill this astonishingly comprehensive role. And uh, Paul's message is simply, this person, Jesus of Nazareth, um, the most documented person that uh, now we have in the, uh, the whole of ancient history, this Jesus is that person, is the Christ. That's who he is. He then goes on to speak about what he's done. 
And that's all comprehended in these four words in the English, raised from the dead. That, in a sense, says it all. And it's that that we're going to look at this evening. And uh, this probably carries something of a, a kind of government health warning for those of you who are uncomfortable with anything more than three points, three headings. Uh, I have to uh, advise you up front, uh, there are seven headings. Seven is a good number in the Bible. It's the number of completeness and perfection. And don't worry, don't start looking at your watch and think, oh, how, how long are we going to be here tonight? Uh, we will run our way through them. But I want you to see something of the, the comprehensive scope of what is being said by Paul when he speaks about Jesus as the one who is raised from the dead. Um, because the, the, the Bible uh, spells that out and explains to us something of the richness, something of the, uh, the expansiveness of this, which, which means that this is the good news. There are um, many who are uncomfortable with miracles, many who would claim to be Christians, who uh, really shunt the resurrection of Jesus to the side and are just a little bit uncomfortable with that because, hey, that sort of thing just doesn't happen. And, and uh, the whole notion of God intervening in a supernatural way is, is something that just leaves them a little bit uncomfortable and, uh, and they will make the claim that, uh, that I am a Christian, but I, I just am not entirely sure about that. So far as the New Testament is concerned, that is not Christian. Um, it's not even remotely Christian. It doesn't matter what else you may believe. You may think that Jesus teaches some amazing things. You may te think that Jesus was an amazing teacher, amazing example. You may even think that he's the son of God. But the moment you shunt the resurrection of Jesus to the side, you have lost the plot. Um, that's why Paul, in the passage that Matt read uh, just a moment or two ago, uh, he underlines this is of first importance. Um, it's it's kind of top-ranking stuff. Uh, so much so that when Paul was in Athens and he was preaching there, you read about that in Acts chapter 17, uh, the Athenians, for whom this was all kind of new stuff, when they came away and you asked them what, what was all that about, they came back and they said it was about Jesus and the resurrection. Um, I, I'm a little bit confused, some of them would be saying, I'm, I'm just not entirely sure, but, but it was about this person and this event, this whole uh, combination of events that is summed up in that word resurrection. That's how central it was. He, he simply could not preach the good news about Jesus without speaking about and making dead center uh, his being raised from the dead. And, and we do need to understand that and appreciate why this is so, so hugely central. Um, it is um, what he has come to do. And, and I want simply to, to run that past you this evening. As I say, there are, there are seven headings. We'll simply run through them and you can explore these really to your heart's content. So I'm, I'm not labor the point on any of them. But the first thing that it underlines for us is in relation to his work and the completion of his work. Um, <clears throat> what Jesus came into this world to do on our behalf because we could not do it ourselves. A wonderful verse in Isaiah chapter 64, I think, where where um, the prophet speaks about this God who, who is like this God who acts on our behalf, who does for us, in other words, what, what needs to be done, but which we can't do. Uh, and that's what Jesus has come to do. He has come to act on our behalf, to do what needs to be done on our behalf. And, and that involved for him, first of all, living a life of matchless obedience, because um, that's what God looks for, uh, a righteous life. And although we may compare ourselves uh, reasonably favorably to a, a lot of other people that we might think about and think, well, you know, I'm a, a deal better than they are, none of us measure up to that. None of us have lived a righteous life so far as the Bible's concerned. None of us lived a fully obedient life. We get it wrong in terms of what we say, in terms of what we do, in terms of what we think, the attitudes that we adopt, the values we espouse, the choices we make, and so on. Uh, we, we get it wrong a million times over. None of us measure. He came to do for us what we could never do ourselves and live that life of perfect obedience. Uh, and that's underlined in Luke's account from the, the very outset of his life. It is an obedient life. And that is a tough, tough call, but he came to do that, to live in the face of all the trials, all the temptations, all the pressures, all the problems, all the aggro, all the hostility directed against him in the face of all the extremities. He came to live out that life of matchless obedience. So much so that uh, 
even his enemies find it very difficult to pin anything against him. Um, and having lived that life of perfect obedience, he then took our place, and in order to satisfy the righteous requirements of the law of God, because that's fine for, for him to live that life of, of perfect obedience, still doesn't help us particularly, because our lives have, have drawn down the condemnation of God. And so he comes, and he comes to bear himself in his own body, in his own person, to bear the righteous condemnation of a holy God upon our lack of obedience. And that's what he's doing on the cross and the death that he dies and, and all the repercussions of that, which is not simply a physical death, but it is, it is the utter, bleak, black, God-forsakenness of that total condemnation of God upon our wrongdoing and our sin. And he bears that in its entirety. And the resurrection of Jesus is the, the declaration from on high that, that his work is indeed complete. By that death, he has now satisfied the requirements of a righteous God for a righteous life and for that which is not righteous to have been dealt with righteously by him. And there is therefore now nothing more that you and I need to add. That, that's what makes Jesus straight off good news. And the resurrection is the clearest indication that is given to us that uh, uh, the work that he came to do has been completed. There is nothing more that needs to be added. No more price needs to be paid. It doesn't matter what you may yet do as a believer. It's already been paid for. It doesn't matter how far off the rails you may go. It doesn't matter how often you may fail. It has all been paid for. And the proof of that is in Jesus having been raised. That's the first thing. Um, you find, if you want a, a kind of text for that, um, Romans chapter 4, verse 25, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. His being raised to life is indeed the demonstration that the, the righteous requirements of the law of God have been satisfied. And therefore, he is able to declare us righteous in Jesus. That's good news. So first thing. Um, second thing the resurrection of Jesus tells us has to do with his person. It is the confirmation of his person as the very son of God. Uh, who is this? Is the question that people regularly were asking about Jesus when they saw the things that he did. Uh, even his disciples in the boat in that storm on the lake uh, of Galilee, remember, um, as he simply stood there in the midst of that boat, they were terrified, silly, out of their wits. They, they didn't know how to handle this particular storm that had blown up, the, the waves lapping over, the winds uh, crashing in upon them, and they are, they are in, in desperate straits. They are frightened, silly, and they, they wake him up, and they shake him awake. He's sleeping at the back of the boat, and they, uh, they get him standing up there, and he simply stands there, and he speaks to the winds and the waves, and says, peace, be still, and the wind and the waves die down immediately and they are left scratching their heads and say who is this um, this is no ordinary man this is no ordinary teacher this is no ordinary rabbi who who is this Jesus uh, when he comes into Jerusalem and the the um, uh, the Palm Sunday, they are asking that question, who is this? Who is this one who performs such miracles? Who is this one who makes the blind to see? Who is this one who makes the, the lame to walk? Who is this one who meets the sinner in their, their deepest distress and transforms a greedy individual into a generous individual? Who on earth is this? Always asking that question and the answer that, that he himself is giving, um, that this is divinity. This is God himself come down amongst us. God himself has visited his people and his resurrection from the dead is again it is a demonstration and a declaration that that's who he is ordinary men and women do not rise from the dead you you hammer the nails through the wrists of an ordinary individual hammer the nails through the the ankles of an ordinary individual crucify them and leave them there to die that excruciating death and then finally get them down from that dead and you bury them in a tomb they don't come out that they are dead they are buried that's finito period end of story um so who is this uh, he is the son of god Whoever seen me, says Jesus, has seen the Father. You're, you're looking at deity when you see me. And, and if you think that that's kind of hard to take on board, uh, the early disciples would have said, well, um, that's, that's the proof. 
the, the resurrection of Almighty God, raising his son like that, um, confirmation of his person. Uh, again, Paul um, in Romans chapter 1 um, alludes to this. I'm not entirely sure that this is precisely the, the significance of that statement right at the start of his letter to the Romans, where he's certainly pointing to Jesus again as the very center of the whole message. Um, speaking about Jesus, descended uh, from David, who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead. Uh, there are a, a couple of ways that that's interpreted, but, but certainly one way of understanding that is um, Jesus always was the Son of God. Um, that, that Paul is not in, in any way suggesting that somehow Jesus became the Son of God. What he's pointed to is uh, the fact that by his resurrection, that has now been made demonstrably plain. That, that's to two years, and now it's plain as daylight for everyone to see the, the power of that resurrection. Um, that, that may be uh, what's indicated there. Um, so the, the completeness of his work, you, you don't have to add anything to this. And then the, the wonder of his person, you are actually meeting deity. God has come. God has made himself known. Uh, we're not talking about a great teacher that we're asking you and inviting you to follow and to heed, uh, although he is a great teacher. We're, we're simply commending to you the one who is God, who brings the, the wisdom and the power and the, uh, the love and the greatness of almighty God into human experience. Thirdly, um, the resurrection of Jesus points to and underlines his kingship. Um, this is um, a, a, a slight move on from who he is in terms of his eternal being. It's now the position that he exercises on our behalf and in our stead. So that in the very first sermon that is preached in the Christian church on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, um, Peter's um, concluding statement, this Jesus whom you crucified, this Jesus attested to you by God uh, through all the miracles and wonders that he did, uh, that Jesus who, uh, about whom you, you know so much, about whose teaching you know so much, about whose deeds you know so much, that Jesus whom you crucified, God has made Lord and Christ. That's, that's the role, that's the position that has been given to him by his resurrection. And, and that's the whole thrust of Peter's argument on the day of Pentecost. Uh, you crucified him, although he was clearly attested to you by God to be the, the one whom God was sending. Uh, you nonetheless, you crucified him, you buried him, you got rid of him like that, but God has raised him from the dead as he said he would. And the fact that God has raised him from the dead you need to be clear about this. That means God has appointed him as Lord. Uh, God has appointed him as the one who will exercise over our humanity in our world and on our behalf as a man that role of kingship. That's who he is. And you'd better believe it, says Peter. Um, that, that's really the thrust of Psalm 2 in many ways, pointing forward to the, um, the installation of Jesus. Right at the start of the book of Psalms, the first Psalm underlines the fact that uh, uh, Scripture is indeed um, the means by which God feeds us his truth, feeds us his life-giving truth, feeds us that word that is always generating light and life. And having uh, underlined that it's, it's through his word, Psalm 1, that, uh, that we derive that benefit. Psalm 2 immediately goes on to speak about the kingship of Jesus, because that's what the whole Bible is about. This Jesus has been made Lord and Christ. And so you find in, in Psalm 2, why do the nations conspire? The people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. That's exactly what happened with the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities. They, they, they rise up together. They, they combine together to get rid of of Jesus. And um, the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Psalm 2 is, uh, is simply underlining that. That's what God has said about this Jesus. I've installed him as king. Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you agree with that or not, whether you want to vote for someone else or not, that, that's irrelevant. God has said, I've installed him as king. He's king. Follow him. 
He's the one who will lead you. He's the one who will protect you. He was the one who will provide for you. He was the one who guide you. He was the one who will rule over you. And it is your wisdom, therefore, it is your life, it is your health to, uh, to know his kingship over your life, to have him exercise that rule in the circumstances of your life. Um, that's um, the, uh, uh, the third uh, repercussion, as it were, of the, uh, the, the resurrection of Jesus that the, the scriptures point to. Um, I, I think that is probably actually the, the more likely um, interpretation of Romans chapter 1 verse 4 uh, where, where Paul is, is underlining that that now is the role that he has. It is the Son of God in power. The Son of God empowered on our behalf to exercise that role as king over humanity. Leave that aside for the minute. There's a fourth uh, repercussion that the, um, the New Testament draws out from the resurrection of Jesus. The fact that God has raised Jesus from the dead signals to us that he, Jesus, is the one who will exercise the judgment of God at the last. That's coming. Um, the whole Bible underlines that, that God is righteous he rules his world in righteousness and he will come, that's what the psalm is always on about, he will come to judge the world in righteousness. So it's coming. The, the scriptures um, aren't afraid to underline the reality of that. It's, it's not up for debate. It's not up for doubt. Um, that's coming. There will be, and you'd expect that to be the case with a God who is righteous, who made this world, loves this world, and runs this world. You'd expect him to to deal with it rightly and and he will there's a day appointed and so when Paul is preaching um, again in Athens Acts chapter 17 verse 31 he says this he has set God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed and he's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead so the judgment is coming and it's going to be exercised by Jesus so you want to get kind of sorted with, with this Jesus because he's the one that you're going to come head to head with at the last. No matter who you are, um, you're going to come head to head with him and he will exercise that judgment of God. And if you're in any doubt about that, um, you have to go back to the resurrection. God has raised him from the dead and he means us to understand from that that this is my man. This is the one who will exercise that judgment in righteousness. What have you done with Jesus? What have you done with the one whom God has sent into this world, through whom God has done so much in acting on our behalf? What will you do with the one whom God has raised from the dead and commended to you as indeed his own beloved son and has elevated and then installed as king? What are you doing with him? Do you, do you kind of keep him at arm's length? Do you just kind of give a nod in his direction or do you bow humbly before him? Do you adore him? Do you love him? Do you follow him? Do you serve him? Uh, where are you in relation to him? Because that's the ultimate question at the end of the day. What did you do with Jesus? And uh, it doesn't matter how long may be the catalog of things that you may think that you're going to be able to plead before the Lord when you get to that great day. It may be that, you know, hey, I, I served as a deacon in this church for 55 years. And, you know, I was there every single Sunday and I read my Bible every night and I prayed. Every, and God will say, so what? What did you do with Jesus? What did you do with my son? How did you relate to him? How did you engage with him? Did you, did you, you simply gladly give yourself to him? and have him to be your Lord, your King, your Savior. Um, that's the, the fourth repercussion of the, the resurrection of Jesus. And you see, we're, we're getting through this. Number five is the, the enjoyment of his presence. Um, you can't enjoy the presence of someone who's dead and buried. You can admire that person and you can respect that person and you can learn from that person at a distance of thousands of years, but you can't enjoy that person's presence. You can't enjoy that relationship with someone who is dead and buried, much as you might like to. But if he's risen, if he's alive, then you can. You can enjoy his presence with you day by day, moment by moment, in all the circumstances and indeed in all the exigencies of your life. And that's got to be good news again. 
and it's Jesus himself who underlines this to them. Uh, in, in John chapter 14, the night of the Last Supper, when he knows that uh, he um, is going to be crucified on the following day, and he's, he's aware that, that that's going to be traumatic for his followers and his, his disciples. They've known his presence with them moment by moment over the course of the past three years. They, they've followed him. Uh, when he's been up in Galilee, they've been up there with him. They've seen the things that he did. They've heard the things that he taught. They've enjoyed being around him. It's just, it's Good being around Jesus, I tell you. You can't read the gospel record without uh, realizing that, you know, when they wake up every day, they, they wonder, what's today going to hold? What's Jesus going to be doing today? What's he going to be saying today? How is he going to handle people today? How many people is he going to uh, help in, in one way or another? Always full of surprises, always full of, of uh, astonishing things that he comes out with. How are you going to handle that situation? And, and it is just a delight to be with Jesus, to, to share with him and what he's doing. And to see the sort of thing that he does and the way that he changes people's lives. What, what a joy it is to be with Jesus. And, and he's aware as he meets with them that uh, the following day he's going to be crucified. It's going to be traumatic. Um, they, they are going to lose the company of the one whose friendship and whose presence they have relished over the course of the past three years. Every problem they've had, they refer it to him. Every time they fall, they go back to him. He picks them up. He puts them on their feet again. He directs them. He corrects them. Helps them in all their different circumstances. He's always around, always there to help them. And now, crucified, he's not going to be there. And so he wants to reassure them. That's not the end of the story. Um, and he, he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. And so in, in John chapter 14, he speaks there uh, as fully as anywhere about the, uh, the way in which he's going to come back uh, among them and be with them by the power of his Holy Spirit. If you love me, keep my commands, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. And um, there's a kind of technicality in terms of the, um, the, the translation. Um, in English, we just say another uh, but if you, if you were a Greek, and if you were Greek-speaking, you would have a choice of two different words as to, to which other you, you wanted to use. Um, so uh, I've, I've got one sock on, for instance. You're not going to look at my feet now. Um, I've got one sock on, and, and I maybe say in a panic when I realize, hey, I, I've got to get out of the evening service in about five minutes' time. I maybe say in a panic uh, to my wife, uh, I wonder, please, could you get me another sock? Now, you could take that in two ways. Another sock could be one that doesn't match it at all. It just is another sock, another different sock. And some of you are wondering, I wonder if I've got the right sort of socks on. Have I got a pair on? Right? I, I think I have, but um, I'm, I'm not going to put that to the test by showing you. But, but I think I've got a pair. In other words, if, if I say to my wife, she's going to make sure that the, the sock that she brings me is another of the same so that I'm not going to look a, a kind of daft loon by patching up with one sock that is blue and one spot, sock that is kind of speckled pink and, and orange and all sorts of other weird colors like that. Um, that's not going to happen. She's going to be a, another of the same. And, and that's the words Jesus uses here. He says, I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another of the same. You're not going to be the loser here because um, the Holy Spirit will bring my presence into your own experience day by day right into your heart you've had me with you now by my spirit I'm going to come and live in you uh, even better even closer um, that's what he's saying to them uh, and that's the language that he uses uh, you love me you'll keep my commands and and we will come and make our home with you dwell with you dwell within you uh, that's the reality that's what he's saying. That's what's going to happen by his being raised from the dead. He is able now as one who is alive to come and dwell in our hearts and live in and through our lives day by day, wherever we are. That makes every situation, turns every situation on its head. It means it's, it's, it's got the potential always to be explosive because it's, it's not me any longer that is living. That's what Paul is on about in Galatians chapter 2. I don't live any longer. It's, it's him. It's Christ who lives in me. And, and what he does is, is astonishing. And uh, I'm able to enjoy his presence. I'm able to turn to Jesus moment by moment and say, Jesus, I haven't a clue what to do in this situation. You're going to have to show me what I do. Um, how do I explain to, to this person you? How do I explain what needs to be said in, in that particular situation? Um, which way should I go? Which street should I go? I need you, Lord, to guide me. I need you to embolden me because I'm terrified silly in this situation. Uh, I enjoy his presence. Um, that's part of the good news. You are meant to enjoy 
Jesus with you. Um, it, it's an adventure. Um, it's a costly adventure. It's a scary adventure. It's, uh, some would say it's a hugely dangerous adventure, although it's actually the safest thing in, in all eternity to live your life with the very Son of God who's prevailed even over death itself. But it's, it, it's not, a, not a bed of roses that he's going to lead you down. It is life. It is the path of life. And you live life with him. That's the fifth thing. Um, I'd love to say a bit more, but we haven't got time for that. Uh, the sixth thing is the, um, the confidence that he gives us of renewal. It's, it's kind of related to this, but it's, it's a, an expansion on what I've just been saying. The enjoyment of his presence is by his spirit now within us, so that um, as well as his simply being alongside us, now by his spirit he comes to transform us from within. Um, so that uh, uh, we, we learn to live by his Holy Spirit doing the living for us in our day-by-day -day lives. Uh, Paul points to that in, in Romans chapter uh, 8 at verse 10. If Christ is in you, uh, and that's the reality for every Christian, when you've uh, um, opened your heart to Jesus, when you've acknowledged him as Savior, you said, Jesus, I, I need you, I'm yours, uh, he comes in by his Spirit. That's, that's just the promise that he makes to every single believer. You trust in him, he comes in. And so when Paul says, if Christ is in you, he's really saying to these Roman believers, he says, since Christ is in you, uh, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, and you're aware of that, that you, you do naturally make wrong choices, you do naturally gravitate and in the wrong sort of reaction, you do naturally want to explode in a wrongful sort of way when someone says something to you or does something to you, and uh, you do naturally want to be resentful and jealous and a whole lot of other things like that. Although that's, that's the reality, you still have this body that is, is sinful, that's not the only reality about you. He goes on, uh, you now have the Spirit, and the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And that's the promise from the Old Testament in Ezekiel chapter 36, for instance, where, where God says, I will give you a new heart. Um, I will take out of you the heart that always goes in the wrong direction. I will put a new heart in you. I will put my spirit in you. And my spirit dwelling in you will enable you to think the right thoughts, will enable you to, to make the right choices, will enable you to say the right things, will enable you to do the right things. He will be the one who lives in you. He will, he will bit by bit just uh, erode all that, that sinful tendency within you, all the, the remnants, the residue of sin. He will, he will bit by bit cleanse you from within and bit by bit transform you more and more into the likeness of Jesus. It's like um, Michelangelo, that, that huge slab of marble. You maybe remember the, the kind of story about Michelangelo where for, for three months, all he did was he looked at that slab of marble. And when people asked him, what are you doing? He'd say, I'm working. And they would kind of look and say, you're working? You're just sitting there looking at a slab of marble. He says, yeah, I'm working. And what he was working at was, was figuring out how he could take that slab of marble and chisel it away and transform it until that slab of marble, ugly, big, cold, and, uh, and, and utterly shapeless, became something that is still viewed with stunned wonder by people today. That, uh, that statue of David, chiseled out of the marble. And what, what God, by his Holy Spirit, comes to do in our hearts is to, to chisel away at all the kind of rough, hard edges of our sinful life and chisel into us that which more and more approximates to the very likeness of Jesus, a work that will one day be completed as we're conformed to the likeness of Jesus. Now, I don't do that, you don't do that. If it's up to me, it's not going to happen. If it's up to you, it's not going to happen. We would like it to happen, but, but left to ourselves, I can't make myself like Jesus. I would love to be like Jesus. I would love to be able to, to know exactly what to say in every situation. I'd love to know uh, how, to, how to handle difficult people. I'd love to be able to sort out problems that arise. But, but I can't do it. And this is, this is part of the wonder of it, that by the Spirit of God, he comes. He comes to live in me and, and to, to work into my life and into my living, that right living that uh, more and more approximates to the, the very likeness of himself, the likeness of Jesus. Um, that's good news. 
good news. He's risen. And because he's risen, he, he comes by his Holy Spirit and still does that powerful work of renewal in our hearts. That's the sixth one. And the seventh is, um, is the most obvious of all. Uh, and that's the, the assurance we have that, that he will raise us as well at the last from death. And so we, we no longer fear death as though that's, that's the end. Uh, we, we now are persuaded that the, the best, doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter how frail you are, doesn't matter how stiff you are, doesn't matter how fragile you are, the best is still to come. Because the one who raised Jesus from the dead will also raise our mortal bodies and will give us life. You think that's unbelievable? It's happened. God has said it will happen, and God never, ever, ever makes a promise that he doesn't come good on. So that in itself should be enough, and God has made that clear. He has said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise you at the last. And in order that we might be doubly sure of that, he has raised his son Jesus so that there is that visible demonstration of his commitment to do that. What is he going to do? He's done it already. You want to see what he's going to do? He has raised his son. And uh, Paul picks that up in First Thessalonians chapter 4, in that famous uh, uh, passage often read at a funeral. Uh, I, I do not want you to be ignorant about those who sleep. And that's the way the, the New Testament now understands believers who have died. They're just asleep. And um, they, will, they will rise. That's what Paul is on about. Uh, why do we say that with such assurance? We, we say that with such assurance because God, first of all, has said that that's what he will do. And secondly, because God has demonstrated that that's what he's able to do. Uh, he's demonstrated his commitment to do that. Um, this is writ large across the pages of the New Testament. And, and that's why we live in hope. The best is still to come. Always. Um, that's, that's always the narrative that the, uh, the scriptures uh, commend to us. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, the path of the righteous those who, who now are righteous in Christ, those who are in relationship with Jesus, the path of the righteous is they, like the first gleam of dawn, just a kind of a, a glimmer of light into the darkness and, and it just shines brighter and brighter until full day and the full day is coming, that day of resurrection when you will be raised from the dead and you will no longer have any pain, you will no longer have any inhibitions, you will have no longer any stiffness, any soreness, any illness, any sickness, or anything like that. You will at last be able to know God immediately, to serve God fruitfully, to love God with all your heart without any interference at all. You will, you will be able uh, to, to uh, enjoy to the full that life that has been uh, secured for us by Jesus. That's coming. That, that's guaranteed to us. Uh, and that's why the, 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 the New Testament uh, majors on this remarkable, astonishing, extraordinary event that happened. Uh, that's why Paul, I think, takes uh, pains to, to explain not only that it's, it's what God was promising he would do, but also how this is testified to and witnessed by such a range of different individuals who all testify, yeah, um, he's raised. I saw him. I touched him. I felt him. I heard him. I've known him. He is raised from the dead. Why does that matter so much? For these seven reasons. Um, he is good news. And his being raised from the dead is always good news. And when Paul rounds off uh, his um, uh, 15th chapter all about the resurrection of Jesus in 1 Corinthians, um, this is what he says. Um, Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always <clears throat> give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So it's, it's not just a, a kind of neat doctrine. This, this has huge ramifications for the way in which we live out our lives in a world that is often confusing, in circumstances that are often difficult, in uh, scenarios that are often strange for us. What does it mean? It means, first of all, you stand firm. You're able to stand firm because 
of who Jesus is and what he's done. He is raised from the dead. And you realize the completeness of his way. He will do for you everything that needs to be done. He is king. He is in charge. He is the one who, who is ruling all things and will bring all things to a good and profitable conclusion. You can enjoy his presence. You will know the renewing power of his Holy Spirit. You will know his help in all your circumstances. And even if they kill you, you know that he's going to raise you at the last. They can do nothing. No one could do anything that is going to spoil. Stand firm. That's the first thing. Second thing that he says as he spells this out is, uh, is um, uh, always give yourselves fully, therefore, to the work of the Lord. Because everything that you do for him and with him, it's never, ever in vain. Never, ever in vain. You may not see the fruit of it. You may not see exactly what God is doing, but, but it's never in vain at all. Your labor in the Lord is, is never in vain. You, you give yourselves fully, day by day, your time, your energies, everything. You, you simply invest it in him and in his work. Um, because the, the resurrecting God is, is well able to take that. However meager you may think that offering is, he's well able to take that and use that for his glory. So I thought we might have a, a kind of um, practical context where we saw how this works out. Uh, Emma. Uh, Emma is, is heading off to university for the, uh, the first time uh, this week, uh, a novel experience for her, uh, not for some of you. Um, and yeah, so, so how does that inform a person's life? We want to pray for her as she goes to um, this new situation. Uh, Emma's been a believer for um, a good number of years. Uh, grew up in a Christian home, learned these truths early on, and now she embarks on a fresh chapter. Um, she, she made a huge difference uh, at school because of the, the integrity of her Christian faith. Uh, and I mean by that the, the way in which the, uh, the convictions that she has in relation to Jesus, the relationship that she has with him, uh, were played out and translated into the way in which she engaged with uh, staff and other pupils alike uh, and, and made a big, big difference in the school, not least in the course of the last 18 months with, with all the difficulties that there have been. And, uh, and, and it's just been a, a humbling thrill to, to see the way in which uh, from a young age, she was someone who was, who was glad to, to give herself, to learn the, the will of the Lord, to see how that translated and um, been used by Emma now, Emma off to, to university. Um, Emma, I'm, I'm going to ask you, you, you um, obviously have a little bit of experience in terms of those who've gone before you, um, Jack and Becca, both know what it's like to be a student. Uh, uh, come in front of the microphone and tell us, wh what have you learned from their experience so far? It's a hard question. <laughs> um, I think from Jack's experience in particular would be to throw yourself into the work of the church that you find. Um, Jack in first year spent, you know, most of his nights out with CU or Release the Word or Christians in Sport and just surrounding himself with, you know, young Christians his age. And I think Becca as well understood or understands the importance of doing that as well. So I'm excited for yeah, meeting Christians my own age and getting involved with a new church. Okay, um, we'll step to that side so we keep our, our reasonable distance between us, nothing the, relationally between us, but um, I wonder now, um, we, we would like to pray for you, but um, as you go, I wonder if, um, if you're able to articulate what in particular you would, you would like us to be praying for you at this time as you, you head off to Edinburgh um, and, a, and a fresh course of study, um, your student accommodation, um, and uh, obviously it's a, a, a different city, um, a different context. What, what would you like us to be praying for you as, as you anticipate that? I think primarily it would be, you know, the things that you've been saying to us tonight and that I would remember um, to stand firm and you know all the guidance and the instruction that I've gained from Gilk over the years particularly from my youth group leaders and yeah so that I would remember that and I would stand firm and that I would be able to 
yeah, represent God in whatever situation I end up in. Um, just stay up here for a moment. We, we want to pray for you. Um, I, I well remember to this day, um, at that day a few years back, when you, you kind of stood there and you professed faith publicly. Uh, that was just a, a delight to us all, and um, not least to your family. Um, I think um, most of you appreciate that um, those of Emma's generation now growing up, it's, it's a very complex very challenging world that they grow up into with uh, huge, huge issues, um, the like of which probably most of you never really had to countenance, never had to, to tackle and get your head around. And, uh, and we, we do value, as, as Emma's pointed, value hugely the, the work that is done through the youth group and before that through the Sunday school and uh, pray regularly for all our parents as they raise their children. So let's join with one another just as we, we round off our service uh, by joining together to pray for Emma. God, our Father, um, thank you for your word. Uh, and thank you for the assurance that gives to us as each of us steps into a new week. Uh, none of us really knowing exactly how that's going to play out, although we, we maybe have our ideas but we want to step into it, Father, with yourself and with your risen Son, and we want to thank you for that immense privilege and for that great joy that is ours. Thank you, Father, for your work in Emma. Thank you for that gracious upbringing that she's received from her earliest days in the home and family where she's grown up. And for every influence in different circumstances that they've been through and she's been through with them, as she's been able to see the way in which her parents handled changing situations, handled difficult people, and was able to, to recognize in them the truth of the good news of Jesus that was explained to her and taught to her from her earliest days. Thank you too for your enabling of her over the course of this past while and the responsibilities that she had at school for the very significant ministry that she exercised at a, a very difficult time for every school and for the, the stature of her living. And as she now embarks on a new chapter uh, we thank you for the, the bond that she has with both Jack and Becca, who've gone before her down that same path, and for every way in which they're able to testify to your help, your enabling, and your being at work in them and through them. And we pray for Emma that as she goes to Edinburgh to start this university career, that she may be very conscious of your hand being upon her, that she goes there at your call, at your behest, and that you will indeed equip her and enable her for all the challenges that she will face, that she may be a very real blessing to the friends that she will make, to the contemporaries that she will find on the course with her, and that you would give to her wisdom and boldness and strength that she may, in all regards, live out the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ through the power of your Spirit and live a life there that will be to the praise of your glory. Help her to put down good roots speedily in a local fellowship, to know the assurance of their prayerful support of her, and may she know your enabling as she gets to know new people as she adjusts to a new course, as she finds out the, the rhythms of a new life down there. Go before her, guard her, keep her, bless her, and help her. And we pray, Lord, for all her family as well, and indeed for those students amongst us as they too look forward now to a new term, a new year 
of academic study with all the disruption that there's been for uh, them all over the course of the past year plus. Be their help, be their enabling. Guard and keep them and enable them to bear a faithful witness to the Lord Jesus Christ, that day by day their eyes may be fixed on him. Thank you too, Father, for the ministry of the youth group and the Sunday school for those who give of themselves in that ministry. May they be assured even this evening, Father, that their labor in the Lord is, is not in vain, but it will bear its fruit down the line in the days and years to come. Receive then our thanks, hear our prayers, and grant us all your blessing as we go from here this evening. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, thank you, Emma. We will uh, assure you of our prayers for you and for uh, all our students. Let's, uh, let's close our worship then by joining to sing a hymn that uh, acknowledges gladly the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. Crown him with many crowns. Go then in peace from here to love, to serve, and to enjoy the Lord. And let's pray for one another in the words of the grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>